Hi, and welcome to module three of lecture one. The previous two modules were pretty long, as you, as you know by now, um, and went sort of shallowly into a great many topics. From now, I want to be focusing more tightly on more specific concrete topics, um, and each module should um, be a little shorter. Anyway, um, so for this module and the next one, we're going to be talking about theory building in political science. So having expressed sort of what political science is as a science, how to you know, actually perform scientific um, research and how to build models to sort of capture interactions in the world, to, to build models of causal explanations. We're now going to focus a little more tightly on how to actually go about building a theory. So um, start with a quote here. Um, what theories are, they're nets to ca cast to catch what we call the world, to rationalize, to master, and to explain it. We endeavor to make the mesh ever finer and finer. So this is really just expressing what we've talked about so far, which is that our goal as scientists is to improve incrementally, to consistently make our theories better, clearer, to explain more of the world um, while getting less of it wrong. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean we come up with massive breakthroughs. Usually most of science um, is the slow march of progress that builds on itself. Um, now, I said we're going to start talking about theory building here. Well, before we even get to theory building, we need to understand what we're looking at, right? What are our research questions? Um, this usually starts by asking a question about the world. Maybe from observation, you, you develop some question, you want to understand how something works. Maybe you identify a puzzle, you see something strange, and you don't know why it happens that way, and you want to figure out why, right? What, what's going on? What's the causal interactions that, is make, that are making this happen this way? Our goal, regardless of your motivation for that question, is to obtain some kind of general explanation of the causal relationship. Um, to do that, right, we're going to try to understand the general phenomenon you're seeking to explain. Right? What is that phenomenon? You need to label that clearly up front so we know what you're talking about. Like, what is your research question? What are you trying to explain? That's the first step. And when you do this, you want to think in terms of concepts, not specifics. Our goal is not to describe very carefully how things are in one particular case. Our goal is to create generalized explanations of the world, of how a causal relationship works in general. So for instance, if you're interested in, say, um, how public opinion moves over time, we wouldn't just focus on how public opinion has moved with respect to a particular politician. Right? Um, we want instead to have a theory of how public opinion moves with respect to maybe any politician, or at least some large subset of politicians, not just the one we're thinking of at the moment. And again, the reason is we're not interested as much in describing how things are, or how things were with public opinion related to that one politician. Rather, we're interested in describing how public opinion moves when it's considering um, politicians in general. That's a difference between description, right, and and causality and causal inference. So um, our primary interest in all this is going to be trying to explain variation, right? We're trying to explain the change in some outcome variable, in some phenomenon of interest, in some dependent variable. Right? These are all the same thing. We're trying to understand how this variation happens as a function of other factors, which we had called the independent variables. That's all we're looking for here, is trying to understand how variation in the dependent variable, in our outcomes, in our phenomenon of interest, is affected by variation in our independent variables and those other factors. That's the goal. To do that, it's helpful to think about first what variation means and what kind of variation you have. So we're going to consider two major kinds of variation here that, that dominate most of the data we will see, spatial and temporal. You want to start off by identifying how variation works in each of those two kinds of dimensions, right? So the spatial dimensions, right, are you looking at variation across citizens in some pop population, across students in a school, um, across individuals in an extended family, or are your individual is your variation happening? Are your actors that are varying um, bigger? Are they local governments or state governments or national governments? Um, like countries, or it's not just the government itself, it's the entire country that you're looking at variation across. Um, this is spatial in the sense that you're looking at a snapshot in time and looking at how things, how units at that time point vary. You also want to identify the temporal dimensions, right? If you have variation across time, 
what does it look like? How fast does it happen? Is a yearly variation um, su sufficient, or must you go more detailed to look at monthly or weekly or even daily variation? And again, this is all variation in your concept of interest, which again is determined by your research question. So one quick thing to ask, as I said, is to look at, you know, is the variation you see happening across units, across time, or both? Right? If it's purely spatial, then you assume that thing that the interest is at a given moment in time and how different units vary. And again, the units can be people, they can be countries, they can be governments, whatever. Um, so this is, all these cases are cases of cross sections, how we multiply multiple, we measure multiple units within a given moment of time. So for instance, um, the number of terror attacks in each country in the world in 1999 is a cross section at a given moment in time of how different countries have experienced terrorism. Um, second example, I'm um, sorry, the second type of variation here is temporal variation. Here you're repeatedly measuring um, some concept for a particular unit across time. So it's repeated measurements of the same unit across time. We call these time series, because they're a series across time, of a particular unit. An example here might be the number of terror, terror attacks that the USA has experienced between 1950 and 1999. That's a series of data for a single country across time. Okay, another example might be um, the military expenditures as a percentage of GDP. This is a cross-sectional example because you're looking at the, the amount of military expenditures um, for each country in the world across time, and here's a subset of those countries with the level of, with the relative percentage of military expenditures on the y-axis and the country on the x-axis. Here's a time series example. This is presidential approval in the US, so it's within a single unit, single country, but it's a time series of approval ratings for the president between 1995 um, and 2005. Okay, um, so that's variation. Now once you have sort of understood your vari variation, you wanna move on to start building the components of your theory. So to do that, um, we want to start off with actors, right? What are the units of interest? Who are the actors in your theory? Right? Where is the variation happening? Is it, are the actors countries? Do you care about how different countries interact in some fashion? Do you care about how different countries evolve over time based on various um, properties of the countries or of their interactions? Um, or is it about people? Do you care about how individuals behave? These are the questions you have to ask first, right? Who are your actors? Who is involved? Who are engaging? Which actors are engaging in your causal interactions, in your causal um, explanations? Once you've identified actors, you want to start thinking about what motivates the actors, right? Why are they doing what they're doing? Are they driven by this factor or that factor? Right? Is, the country is the country's behavior driven by strategic interactions between countries or the economic status internal to that country or trade between countries? or all of them, these all matter. Um, what constrains the actors, right? What's limiting the actor's behavior? Can they do whatever they want, or are they constrained by some outside force, or some institution that might limit their behavior, right? In the US, we have tons of institutions that, to a greater or lesser extent, limit what we can do and how we can express our interests and our motivations. Once you've done, once you've sort of worked through who your actor is, what motivates them, what constrains their their actions, right? You have to start thinking about how to actually go about applying logic to understand your problem, right? What should we assume about our actors and their behavior and their constraints? Um, what do we feel comfortable assuming? What seems too far? What seems not tenable? What seems um, uh, too strong an assumption for us to make? And what seems like it, it's quite reasonable given the context we care about. Um, so a very common example of that is when we think, when political scientists study elections, one of the core assumptions that political scientists have used for decades is that politicians want to be reelected. So they do things to get reelected. That might not be the case in all situations, but it's been a common assumption and it seems to apply in a bunch of cases. So people are generally willing to make that assumption they might not be willing to make different assumptions that are less generalizable. Um, once you've identified these assumptions, you're also thinking about what these assumptions imply. You know, so what follows from these assumptions? And most of all, um, what's our scope condition here? Like, 
can we generalize from the particular example, the particular puzzle, the particular um, pattern we saw in the world to a larger population, right? So if I'm thinking of actors that are countries, because I happen to be motivated by, you know, a particular war or a particular trade interaction or whatever, right? Can I generalize that to different circumstances, right? If I'm looking at um, public opinion dynamics and they shift suddenly, can I generalize the behavior? And I want to understand that shift, right? Can I generalize from that one example that I saw to other possible shifts? Okay. To do that, we want to be very clear and define our concepts well. Um, a conceptual definition is a meaning we assign to terms, right? These definitions are shared understanding. They, they, they are a way for us all to think about complex concepts in a clear and coherent way. So, for instance, um, democracy. Right? Democracy is a fraught term. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So, when political scientists are deal with it, they tend to cl classify things as democracy or non-democracy based on a series of different measurements. Um, and political scientists disagree on that and have different ways of measuring democracy. And it's actually a pretty vibrant field in terms of how to properly measure democracy. But the idea is these underlying conceptual definitions that include things like the ability to have a say over the government, right? To be able to participate in, in the form of government, at least, and possibly in governmental action as well. Constraints on the executive power that so they can't just do whatever they want if they're in power. These kind of things tend to be common democracies and get included in these conceptual definitions. Um, and we share them and sort of have a common understanding of what it means to be democracy in this context. Right? But don't confuse these with reality, right? We're not explicitly saying that this is exactly how things are. We're saying these concepts um, are a perception of things with common characteristics, right? They seem like commonalities across different democracies, say, but don't necessarily um, co correspond exactly to a particular democracy in the real world. Um, these are just tools we use to help us describe the world. These concepts help us um, influence the way we measure our concepts. Um, so our definitions help us measure the concepts accurately, and that's really important, right? If our focus on democracy is about participation and active um, participation in government, our measurement of that might be very different than if our focus of democracy is about um, constraints on the executive power. They might, be, they might have overlapping measurement characteristics, but they might also have very different things. Um, so, for example, um, political knowledge, right? So we want to know, you know, what do we mean by how much someone knows by how much someone knows about politics? There are many different ways to measure political knowledge. Um, one might be awareness, right? So, if our concept focus of knowledge focuses more on being aware of the political sphere, um, we might measure things like how attentive is that individual to politics. Um, we can do this by taking measurements of their knowledge of civics or current events, right? So I might ask us a battery of questions that probe an individual's understanding and knowledge of civics and current events. And that those would be good measurements if our core concept of political knowledge focused more on awareness. In contrast, we might also think our core concept of knowledge might focus more on sophistication, the ability to sort of think through political problems clearly um, and accurately. In which case, we don't necessarily want to um, focus on factual knowledge. We might want to focus on the ability of an individual to think non-ideologically, right? Not to be completely um, following a partisan rule, rule kit, but instead think through political questions using their own knowledge and their own um, logic behind it, right? So now we might ask them questions across multiple issues and see if they fall into a, a, what many people do, which is a strict partisan framework, which um, you just basically follow the, the party's policy list, or if they fall into what other many people do, which is have policy preferences across the spectrum in different dimensions and don't necessarily fall neatly into particular parties' um, uh, preferences, platforms. Um, so this can help us understand how sophisticated a thinker the person is Usually we assume if a person has different policy preferences, they've thought about them in some fashion, whereas it might be easier to just take a party's platform as a given if they follow that platform exactly. So that's another sort of idea for um, 
to measure political knowledge. And again, it depends on what concept you're going for, awareness or sophistication. Um, once you sort of work through this, you want to start reviewing existing research. You want to understand what's out there already. And this is mostly to save you time, right? You don't want to reinvent the wheel. You want to see what other people have done already. And in cases like democracy or political knowledge, many people have worked on this a lot. So you can save yourself a ton of time by looking to see what's out there already. That helps you, um, that helps you not only save yourself time, but also make your research more understandable to others who have already worked in this area. And that helps the sort of conversation between you and them happen and move forward well. So first you wanna ask yourself, you know, how have others approached this question? Um, what, what they have missed? What do they do very well? Um, that helps us accumulate knowledge, as I said. That helps us figure out what are accepted conceptual definitions. Um, if you're going to go against the grain and have a completely different definition, that can be fine, but it can be a higher bar to explain to people why your definition is the one they should use instead of the ones they've already been using in the past. Um, so that's true for conceptual definitions and also for operational definitions, right? Not just how you conceptualize a concept like political knowledge, but also how you measure that concept. Um, and that helps, again, besides what I just said, it helps replicate past research. So we know, you know, how well your results comport with conform to early results or if they upend early results. And it helps others replicate your research, right? We just discussed how science is all about um, a slow accumulation of knowledge and, and things to be falsifiable, right? Well, it's very difficult to falsify your results if they can't actually replicate what you've done. So this is a way to go about um, replications, so I can see if measuring, say, your core variable of political knowledge on a different group of individuals gives you the same results that you had. And if it did, that provides additional support to your ideas. So this is also good for you long term to help individuals build upon your own ideas and give them more traction and more play over time. Okay. So that's that. Um, next time, I'm going to move on to a, a particular way of theorizing and building theory, formal theory. Thank you.